problem. Good morning. It's good morning, everybody. Uh, it's afternoon for me and it's afternoon for our speakers today or most of them. So uh, forgive me for my little uh, what's going on here moment. Um, so today we're having a presentation by eWorld Enterprise Solutions, Inc., one of the sponsors of the 2024 hack. And they're going to be giving a presentation on serverless web applications and unleashing the power of the cloud. And I'm kind of excited about this one because it's kind of nice to see alternative ways to build solutions out there. And eWorld is one of our groups that always come up with a new way to solve a problem with code or no code or low code and et cetera. So this is a nice change of pace from some of the things we've done before. And uh, to, today I want to introduce first Carrie Ho. He is the, the person behind this process and he's going to be helping out uh, with some tech review and some support for uh, questions and answers on the, and his team are going to be answering questions on the Slack channel uh, S underscore eWorld as one of our sponsors. So I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. And he is going to give you a little background, and then Ari and Caitlin will be giving uh, Caitlin will be giving presentations and uh, demos. All right, great. Thank you, Thelma. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Carrie Ho. I'm a director here at uh, eWorld. Um, we're happy to present the the presentation on serverless web applications. Um, let me tell you a little bit about eWorld Enterprise Solutions. We are agnostic to a lot of these cloud providers you'll see out here, the Google, Azure, Amazon. As a matter of fact, eWorld, we work as a, a partnership with those large cloud companies. So uh, as you know, like uh, if you've used any of those cloud uh, services, they provide a lot of these services for these companies to operate in the cloud, but they themselves are not implementers of solutions, right? That is where uh, eWorld comes in. So we work with Google, we work with AWS, we work with Azure. Uh, we'll come in and we'll implement their technologies to provide solutions for, for different clients. Um, we work across a lot of different uh, uh, government uh, clients from state of Hawaii moving out to the federal space um, over in Vegas and California. So eWorld essentially works with all of the cloud providers. That is a good, unique, um, a unique uh, approach, how eWorld, in terms of our technology and technologists, we experience the best of what all of those cloud providers um, offer. Now, today we will specifically be using um, the Google Cloud uh, platform for our demo, but it was not chosen out of any specific reason. Um, it's just the one we decided to pick today. And as as you'll see in, in this presentation, there are several serverless web application um, alternatives across all of those uh, 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 providers. Right? So that being said, eWorld, as a partner, we work with all of the different technologies on all different projects, spanning from web applications, call center applications, uh, uh, adding in AI. We use G, uh, ArcGIS, so we've got a lot of uh, GIS applications, um, whole gamut of different types of uh, projects using all different types of technologies. So eWorld is a great place if you want to have that sort of uh, broad experience, not necessarily relegated to like just AWS or just Google. We hit everything. Um, so that is where we are with eWorld. Now I'm here accompanied with two of my colleagues, uh, Ari Essenfeld and Kaylin Hirakawa, technology specialists. Um, they will uh, teach you a little bit about how serverless web applications uh, are used and what they are. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ari to start off the presentation. Great, and thanks I, so much. Karen. I just want to remind everybody that they are uh, asking you to put your questions into the chat 
uh, but they're going to uh, discuss them and address them at the end of the presentation or after the demo? Uh, after the demo. After the so demo. after the demo. So uh, don't forget what you were wanted to ask. Type it in a chat and we will get to it after that. Thank you very much. Okay, Ari, you're next. Great. Thanks, Thelma. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ari Essenfeld, and I'm going to give a bit of an overview of serverless architecture and serverless web apps today. Then I'm going to uh, describe some of the um, some of the cloud providers that offer these kinds of uh, products that you can use to build serverless web apps. Go into the details, sort of compare and contrast AWS, Google Cloud Platform, and Azure, and uh, then talk about some of the specific features of, of GCP or Google Cloud Platform that you can use to build your own serverless web app, at which point I'll hand it off to Kaylin for, for a demo of doing exactly that. So let's jump into it. Um, first of all, what is serverless? What is serverless architecture? Well, it's a it's an event-driven architecture where um, things happen when they're triggered by HTTP requests or database updates or other events, like a file being added to a database or someone making a, a request to a specific API endpoint. And you don't have to worry about the server. So there's no server management. The cloud provider, like Google, for instance, automatically handles the, the infrastructure side of things, including scaling and, and scaling down the infrastructure. So that lets uh, developers who are building serverless web apps focus on code and only code. And you can put all your time and effort into writing and optimizing that code without having to manage the underlying systems that are running that code. Um, so most of these serverless uh, products use a pay-per-use model. So you're only paying for the compute resources that you use, and you're not paying a cost for for having access to the resource. You're only paying when the resource is being used. One so, little comment on mm -hmm. one little comment on that is um, when you think of serverless, it's not like just a, a function or it, it is like a function that you can execute, but also like these offerings, they'll they'll offer things like databases that are serverless, right? There's Aurora Aurora serverless for Postgres, where you don't have to manage any of the the infrastructure, but you can still use Postgres as you normally would, or something, or they'll have their own offering for a no SQL solution. So uh, Google has their Firestore. Um, so serverless is a lot of the functionality, but none of the infrastructure. You can think of it as as that. Yeah. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, Ari. Um... So some of the key benefits offered by, by serverless uh, include cost optimization. And, and this happens in a lot of ways. So one of the ways is this pay as you go pricing where you're only paying for the compute time that you use. And that allows you to minimize the resource waste, uh, but it also offers automatic scaling. So if one day you have a thousand users coming to your web app and a lot of traffic, the cloud provider will scale up the resources that it's provisioned for your app. And as soon as the traffic goes down, it'll scale it back down. And that way you can avoid things like over-provisioning. Um, and you also don't have to worry about being able to meet the demand when the demand is high. Um, this leads to lower operational expenses. So you don't need as many DevOps personnel managing a large uh, server or or large compute capacity, and you also have uh, reduced overhead for your infrastructure. And I think biggest of all, if you're uh, you know an individual or a small company, it's it's really nice because there's a much lower barrier to entry. You don't have to invest a large amount of money into in-house servers or a data center or something like that, because the cloud providers already have that, and so you're just going to offload that part of the work and they will manage that and you can just work on the code. Yeah, Jerry, and yeah. I, yeah, I just wanted to add some real world examples behind this. So for instance, um, I was on a project where we were using um, 
uh, just a regular RDS, uh, like a relational database. Um, and we had to scale it really high. And so we're paying a lot of costs for the amount of compute we're using for it. Um, and it's persistent, right? So when you're using an infrastructure, I need, you know, eight, eight CPUs and 64 gigs of memory or whatever. And so you allot that amount just so that you can handle those peak peak processes. When we switch from this, and this was in this case, AWS, we switched from using an, a, a, an RDS with infrastructure to a serverless version of their Aurora uh, Postgres. Um, we could minimize the amount of processing uh, that uh, is required for day-to-day -day usage, and it auto scales out um, because it's serverless. You just use virtual compute, virtual memory. It'll all auto scale out only when you really need the peak processing, and then it goes back down. And so we saved quite a lot of money. We we had a lot of uh, huge cuts um, in expenses uh, for all of the RDSs that we were using. Um, and for other things like that, when you have uh, a lot of batch processes that run maybe once a day or or periodically, or even event-driven uh, when a file drops, you don't need that persistent architecture. So the cost optimization there, you're paying very little amount. Um, so something to, to, to think about, especially if you're starting out, you're a startup company, or you're just tr playing around, you don't want a server always running. You can... Um, you can use the serverless architecture so you're only paying for when it actually runs, which is a huge cost savings. Uh, thanks, Ari. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. That thanks for those uh, anecdotes. Yeah, I think that ties into some of the um, use cases that that I want to talk about here. So yeah, you mentioned the the scalability. Um, another thing is the availability. So uh, not only will it scale up and scale down based on demand, um, but it can handle traffic spikes in a way that would be very hard to handle if you were managing your server in-house because sometimes you may have uh, unexpectedly very high surges and these data centers that the cloud providers have access to are capable of handling that without any performance degradation in a way that only someone with th that quantity of, of uh, compute capacity would be able to do. Um, they also have extremely high uh, availability and redundancy, so you can count on uptime in in a way that you couldn't really otherwise. Um, and of course, global reach, right? These cloud providers already have a global presence, so that makes it much easier to deploy your web apps or other products across multiple regions and, and get a wider reach. Um, some other benefits include just a faster development and deployment cycle. Since your developers can focus on the code and not the infrastructure, that uh, makes the whole process more efficient. They, they can work on one thing rather than two things. And um, the cloud providers have you know very clear interfaces that allow for simple and seamless updates, and it can work with your existing CI CD pipelines and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but also just this reduced operational overhead really allows uh, developers to avoid context switching or always thinking, oh, how will this update to the code affect our, our resources? And will, will, will we be putting too much strain on the server and things like that? You don't have to, you don't have to put that kind of thought into your development process. Um, and of course, the integration with other services and including others uh, serverless architectures and features uh, is all it's all easy to implement right there's uh, it's very friendly towards apis and and any kind of things that you would want to integrate um, so mm -hmm. i do i do on that last slide have more uh, <laughs> real, real world um cases on this um like I mentioned before, how we did a lot of those transitions to moving service, we had legacy applications. And when I say legacy applications, I think I'm thinking more of, uh, this is in the case of AWS running on EC2s, right? Run on virtual machines out in the cloud. But when we moved off of those things, those persistent architectures, when you're in a large organization, right? Um, especially if it's 
uh, working with the government. There are a lot of security type um, efforts that go that are involved in projects. And one of those efforts, like if you're running a virtual machine, right? virtual machines, they essentially run off images of like a, of an OS, right? I'll be running a virtual machine that's running on a specific image of uh, uh, Ubuntu, let's say, an Ubuntu server. This is just an example. But every month or so, if you, especially if you're working in governments or something that's regulated, they'll have to have security patches. You have to always update your, your virtual machines, do redeployments constantly because of this. That's a large manual effort. But when you go to something like serverless, you don't have to worry about that. All of that stuff is handled within the cloud. All you have to worry about is your code. You don't have to worry about the scalability. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just need to make sure your code is running and it's out there. So in the cases of moving away from like virtual machines, in this case, we used AWS Fargate uh, running the containers, don't have any persistent architecture to worry about. It could have been done using um, Lambdas or in GCP, the Google Cloud Run functions. Either way, what you're doing is cutting that down, all of those operations, the infrastructure maintenance, and just focusing on writing the code and, and making sure that works. And it really helps cut things down. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Kerry. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about, yeah, some of these, these uh, real world applications of, of serverless architecture. Um, APIs are a great example. So if, uh, if you have a, a mobile or web app and you want a RESTful API, you can implement that, um, using serverless architecture and some of the, uh, some of the applications, you know, chat applications, live dashboards, anything that is event driven, a user wants to initiate a customer support ticket or customer support chat with either a real agent or a virtual agent. Well, something will need to be spun up for that. And that is uh, a very event-driven kind of example. A live dashboard needs to be updated periodically or updated when a user pulls it up and wants to view it. Um, background tasks like image processing and data analysis. Maybe you have data coming down from an instrument or a sensor somewhere periodically. And when it arrives, you need to denoise it and process it and then add it to a database or whatever. These are all background tasks that you don't want to have a, a server running 24 seven to handle that. You want it to be able to spin up when the data comes in and then spin down when the task is complete. Um, Internet of Things applications are another example where you have various connected devices and one may uh, have a failure or need to push a notification or something like that. These are all event-driven operations. Um, and yeah, essentially any event-driven workflow that you can think of where you want actions to be triggered based on specific events and for things to happen, that these are all perfect uh, perfect use cases for, for serverless architecture. Carrie, maybe you have something to add about these? Yeah, actually, it, it is good to, to, to think about how a lot of these um, uh, cloud providers, they, they, they give you serverless architecture, but they also tie them all together. And a lot of that is where they're talking about like these event driven workflows, um, background tasks, etc. For instance, like uh, um, storage, let's just talk about storage, like S3 is Amazon storage, or they have Google Cloud storage, right? You don't have to worry about hard drives. You don't have to worry about the file systems mounted onto a server, et cetera. All it is is area for you just to dump files. You can upload files. You can access files on, on the net. You can access files in your, in your um, cloud architecture. You don't have to worry about how any of that is done. It's scalable and it, and it, and it grows. Um, but one of the things about it, though, is that they tie in things like triggers. So, uh, for instance, a background task, image processing. Let's say I upload a file. I'm on a website. I upload a file. These files might go through some different types of processing that needs to be done. So the second that file drops on S3 or Google Cloud Storage, a trigger is 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 um, 
triggered. So there, a trigger happens, it knows the file dropped, and you can hook into more serverless components that can know that the trigger happened, know that the file dropped. Your little function now will go and pick up the file and perform all sort of image processing you need. So it can like uh, scale them, cut them to be square, however you want to do image processing. It can do that on the fly. So there's nothing about polling. So event-driven workflows, how they do it in background tasks, how they tie all these different types of service architectures together is really amazing. And they can really cut down a lot of uh, the work that's involved in building like a web application. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, what a, what a good example. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, the different options out there for, for building something with serverless architecture. We've mentioned AWS, GCP, and Azure, and each of these offer their own serverless functions. AWS calls it Lambda, Google Cloud calls it Google Cloud Functions, and Azure calls it Azure Functions. And uh, while they're all sort of similar in that they all do the same kind of thing, there are some differences that I think are worth talking about. Um, so AWS Lambda is the most mature of these three platforms. It was released in 2014, um, whereas Google Cloud Functions is a little more new, I think 2018, but it uh, is you know known for being very highly scalable and also has a really strong Google Cloud integration. And of course, Azure Functions, uh, as you would expect, seamlessly integrates with all of the Azure services. So I think the factors to consider when trying to pick between these three are um, language support. You know, which language, which uh, programming languages are your developers comfortable with, or are you comfortable with, and what what uh, languages do do each of these three kinds of serverless functions support? Also, the pricing model. But most importantly, I think the integration needs. So if your company or your organization already has all of its data in Google Cloud storage, then you'll probably want to use Google Cloud functions because of that integration. Whereas if they are already storing everything with Microsoft databases, you'll want to use Azure functions. And if you already have a lot of AWS uh, presence established, then you'll want to use your AWS lambdas. Um, so just to get into some of the details between these different platforms or Carrie, yeah, jump. jump One more in. thing to mention. Sorry, Ari. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, I did, I did want to uh, uh, highlight that what he's talking about here are mainly like um, uh, things to execute code, right? So that would be Lambda, the Google Cloud functions, other functions. Those are all services, uh, serverless services that allow you to execute code. But when you talk about serverless architecture, there are many components to it, right? So if you're talking about storage, right? We mentioned there's the the Google Cloud store, there's the Google Cloud storage, there's Amazon S3. If you're talking about databases, there's like AWS Serverless Aurora, they have uh, Cloud SQL, there's DynamoDB, there's a whole bunch of other ones that are no SQL or relational in terms of like data stores that are completely serverless, right? So we talk about serverless, there are a lot of different things. Other things to consider is some may offer serverless uh, options different than others. Uh, and an example of that would be like, if you're, you, you, if you may have heard of uh, big data out in the space, right? Big data is handled very differently in how they do it in Google Cloud's platform being serverless and their offering is called BigQuery versus how AWS offers it. So their serverless uh, is is less hand-holding, I'd say, for big data, where you have to use things like Athena and the Glue catalog versus um, uh, Google, where you have services like uh, BigQuery, Dataplex. So does take some investigation they do offer lots of different serverless type functions um, besides what you'd, you'd see just here. These are the, the simple ones to execute code. But once you start building larger architecture, there's a lot of different things to explore. Um, and I would encourage you to look at all the different offerings between them. They, they do differ some when you get into complex functionality.
Right. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. So like, like you said, these are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud functions and Azure functions are, are the components that execute code. Um, and of course, architecture refers to the, the wider ecosystem. But uh, as far as the components that execute code go, there are similarities, but uh, there are also a few differences that I just want to highlight. So language support is one of them. Um, you may want to consider that before picking one, uh, if if it does or doesn't support the language that you're interested in developing with. Um, we've talked about integration. Execution time, I think, is an interesting one to bring up. So these are these um, these serverless functions are really designed for short operations. Something happens and spins up, executes some code, and then it's done. It's not meant to be a, a long running process. So AWS Lambda will allow you to run for up to 15 minutes by default. Google Cloud Functions, if it's an event triggered operation, that's going to run only up to nine minutes. Um, it does support a 60 minute execution time if it's an HTTP function rather than an event triggered function. And then the uh, Azure functions run up to five minutes with the, the default plan or 60 minutes with the premium plan. And something that I think is kind of interesting to, to know about and talk about here is the, the concept of a cold start. So the first time you, you uh, hit an API endpoint or the first time you're you know, triggering an event that's gonna cause one of these functions to run, there's gonna be some delay. Um, usually it's manageable, it's nothing, nothing so severe, but there's a little bit of delay while the cloud provider provisions the resource. And then you can almost think of it as like, after that the cache is, is hot and any subsequent requests will happen in just as long as it takes the code to run. Um, and you can pay a little bit more with Azure to avoid cold starts. And you can uh, be a little strategic about which languages you're choosing to develop with to have shorter or longer cold starts, but it's just something to consider. Um, and another point I wanna make here is that the, the pricing models for these cloud providers, I think are really generous in that you get a million free requests per month and a very large amount of compute as well free per month before you have to start dealing with the pay per use model. And even at that stage, I mean, these are very small costs per request. So if you're an individual or a small group and you're trying to put together a web app that you don't expect will have a lot of traffic and not be making a lot of requests, you can deploy that really easily for free as long as you're not exceeding these um, these quotas each month. And that I just think is one of the most exciting benefits of, of this is that you don't have to worry about those those resources and that upfront investment. You could you could make something really modern and uh, enterprise grade without without paying a dollar or even a penny for it. Carrie, is there anything you want to add? Um Sure. Uh, I, I'd like to just make one comment about the cold start. And if you are writing web applications, my my recommendation would be to use something like Node.js instead of Java. Java is very slow to start if you're doing microservices. If you're doing, especially if you're doing these like serverless um, architectures, when you use Java to to run, they can be very slow, slow to start because if it's been what they call that cold start and no one's used it in a while, they have to restart your whole application again. And that takes some time. Um, one thing that AWS did, because they recognized Java in particular as being very slow to start, they created something called Snap Start, which is a, a very cool thing where after it's been started, you can take a snapshot of the image um, of your uh, uh, serverless application. So the next time it starts or whenever it starts, it doesn't have to start from scratch. It can just load up a hot that image um, right away. So there's no like, you know, spooling up of the, the services from a virtual machine. It's just that virtual machine started um, automatically from that snapshot and it's much faster. Um, we, we use that in some of our um, applications previously. So 
AWS has recognized that I'd not seen that in the other cloud functions if you're using Java, but my recommendation would be if you're going to do web apps, Node.js is by far faster and easier to, to, to code with. That's all. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Right, so now uh, we're getting close to the demo, so I think I'll give a little bit of background and then soon be handing it off to Kaylin. So um, what we're going to try to show you today is, is the process of building and deploying a serverless web app using GCP. And uh, like Carrie mentioned at the beginning, we eWorld is agnostic to these various cloud providers. So we just happen to choose GCP for this example. Um, Google Cloud Platform or GCP uh, can be used for rapid serverless development and deployment. And the example that we're going to show today is uh, building a, an album library web app. So we're going to try to have a, a web interface where users can add and remove albums. These are like music albums. And the albums will have cover art, release date, artist, duration, other kinds of metadata that users can edit and uh, customize and tune to their liking. So to do that, we're going to use three key serverless architecture components. And these are Firestore, which will store the data related to the albums. Uh, this is going to be the, the structured data, which we'll also expect to change more often. Um, cloud storage, or Google Cloud Storage, which will hold the unstructured data, like the album cover art images, which is going to be a little more static. And then Google Cloud Functions to handle all of the uh, CRUD operations, or create, read, update, delete operations for these albums. And of course, all of the HTTP requests and other event-driven uh, operations and updates. So, Carrie, you you want to say something about that? Yeah, just one quick thing. Those three components um, in AWS, the equiv equivalents would be for Firestore would likely be DynamoDB, Cloud Storage is Amazon S3, Cloud Function, Cloud Run functions. It would be. Um, uh, lambdas, um, but lambdas difference between cloud run functions. Cloud run functions will automatically give you an endpoint. Lambdas, I don't believe they do. You'd have to go through an ALB, so that's application load balancer, one of their other things. So, like I said, little differences, but primarily it would be um, DynamoDB, S3, and lambdas. Right. So. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of these three components. And I think we've talked about Firestore a little bit already today. But uh, as a reminder, it's a NoSQL document-based database. And it's uh, ideal for, for structured data like albums, songs, and artists. Um, some of the key features are real-time syncing, scalability, and support for all the kinds of CRUD operations that you would need. and Today, we're going to be using it to store metadata like the album names, release dates, artist names, album lengths, uh, the other text field kind of information. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, the other data store component that we're going to be using, is uh, excellent for large unstructured files like images. And uh, some of the key features are the durability and security that come with being a a cloud provider uh, offered resource, easily scalable for large amounts of image data. And uh, we can connect it with Firestore by referencing the, the images via the URLs. So we can store a, sort of a pointer to those in Firestore. And third, the Google Cloud Functions is what we will be using as a backend. So Cloud Functions will handle all the backend logic and these functions will be triggered by HTTP requests for things like creating a new album or uploading an image or you know, fetching data for a specific album or updating some of the metadata or even deleting an album. And of course, it will all be serverless and scale automatically up and down as needed and only running uh, when triggered to do so. So with that, I think I'm at the stage where uh, I can hand it off to Kaylin. And just as a reminder, we're going to be trying to build and deploy a serverless album library web app 
using Google Cloud functions as a backend and Firestore and Google Cloud Storage. And the goals of this web app are that users can add and remove albums, they can edit the album metadata, and that we store all of that information in the cloud. So Kaylin, take it away. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Ari. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kaylin Hirokawa. I'm a software developer at Euron Enterprise Solutions. So let me start sharing my screen and I can start sharing the demo. All right, so as Ari gave the context, we're going to be showing uh, an application that is created and hosted on the Google Cloud Platform uh, with this, this album manager. So in here, all of this data that we're getting for like the covers, the images to all the different metadata, like titles, release date, and descriptions. All of that is being loaded from uh, the Firestore module and also the Google uh, Cloud Storage module within the Google Cloud Platform. And so in here, this web application, what we can do is that we can add albums, we can edit them, we can delete them. Uh, and so if I wanted to add an album, for example, I can just uh, click an add button here. Uh, we can start typing in like what we'd want. So maybe I can say I want a deep blue album. Uh, let's say it was released on the 21st in 1999. The description, let's say it's the sweet songs of the sea kind of thing. And then 30 minutes. And let's say it's maybe uh, eight traps. And then we can upload an image that we want for our album cover like so. Uh, we can hit save, and then what's happening is it's going to take a moment to save. And we can see here, if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see our new entry. Uh, we can see that our data has been saved, uh, that it's being loaded. Uh, and of course, if we want to edit this data, uh, we can do so with an edit button. Uh, and we can also do so later if we want to delete this as well. Um, but I'm going to take a quick pause before I go into those two other features so we can see how did this data get saved? How is it coming back within the Google Cloud Platform architecture for this serverless web app? So let's take a look under the hood real quick. And so all of this um, for how we're rendering this web application, we are in Google Cloud Storage. So in Google Cloud Storage, we can put you know, our index HTML, we can put our main script, uh, JavaScript file, um, all the covers uh, for all of these different albums, uh, we can save them in here uh, as this is an enterprise grade uh, storage uh, area. So we can put all of our images uh, in here and save them. Uh, but where's the metadata going? Where are we saving like the title, the date, so on and so forth. And so there's ties into our Firestore um, module inside Google Cloud Platform. So in Firestore, we're using, which is like a NoSQL uh, database. So it's very lightweight and it's very good when you wanna just save a document like structures that don't really need to have uh, relations. And so in here, we just wanna be able to save like a list of uh, different album uh, information. So if we even look up here for let's say, like the Echoes of Eternity, uh, we can see that there's the Echoes of Eternity, uh, there's the album title, there's the description, um, there's the length, the release date, and tracks. Uh, the ID, so the ID, what's really great also about uh, this NoSQL database is that you can control which kind of identifying protocol you want to use. So if you want to just use integers like this, or if you want Google, uh, will also you can, it can auto-generate an ID for you automatically, um, or if you want it to, you can use UUIDs. Um, but this is where our example just now was saved, the deep blue. Uh, it has a URL to our cover art, which is stored in here in the covers folder. Uh, and then we can see our description, length, release date, and tracks. Um, and so we can find this cover in our uh, Google Cloud Storage, uh, just so we can see. There's our amazing album image that we just uploaded just now into our web app. Uh, and so we can modify this as well through our web app too. So let's say I go back down to my entry for Deep Blue. Let's edit this. Uh, let's say I wanted to change the cover. Uh, or sorry, let's change the title to Secret Wave. Um, let's say let's, I want to leave my cover image. 
um, let's say I want to change the date. Um, uh, and you just want to like update information in general. Oops. And let's see, it's actually 10 tracks. So we can hit save. Uh, we can see here our information has updated. The title is different. Uh, the date is different. Uh, all those things. Uh, we can go back to Firestore. Uh, we can do a quick refresh on this page so we can see the updated data. Go down here and we can see, okay, there we go. All of our metadata has changed um, and we can uh, continue forward. Uh, if we were, if we want to delete this entry and we're like, oh, we don't need this album or I don't want this in my list anymore, uh, you can have a delete button. Um, you, can utilize, you can utilize whatever UI element you would like, but you can have like a confirmation. You can hit cancel if you don't actually want to delete it. But for this demonstration, we do. So I can hit OK. Um, the albums will automatically reload your list and you can see that it's gone. We can go back to Firestore and do a little refresh so we can see that data. And we can see that, okay, our data is gone because that we wanted to do that intentionally through the web app for that one entry. So we are able to use create, editing, um, reading and deleting operations, uh, but the third and last module of how is this all working um, to be able to do those CRUD operations uh, is in the Google uh, Cloud Functions area. So in here, uh, it, it's all our API can be uh, stored here in various functions. Uh, and what's great about Google Cloud Platform uh, is that you can just uh, edit your source uh, of, and you can Put the runtime, whether you want it to be uh, Node.js, or you can use Python, or you can use very, various other languages. Um, but you can use uh, lightweight um, uh, languages that don't necessarily have to be Java for anything like a server. And you can program like your API, like your get calls, your post calls. And uh, you can have uh, the Google Cloud Platform just spin up your API, your REST API uh, path. And so your web app can just tie right in. You can put in your various uh, authorizations as well within, and we're still all within the Google Cloud Platform architecture, so we haven't left at all. So all of these resources, your web application, this is a very simple uh, application for this demonstration. Um, however, this can always be expanded. You could have, um, if you wanted to put more um, information about uh, like an album in here, or you wanted to put upload other images or other files or other documents, um, you can still do all of those within just these three modules uh, and then modify them as needed for your needs. So all of these, uh, the Google Cloud Storage, Firestore, uh, Google Cloud uh, Functions, uh, they can all work together to create your web app that you uh, want to deploy. And of course, you don't always need to have a web app that is like a, a URL like this. You can definitely like uh, change things around. Uh, but what's great is that Google Cloud Platform can just get you up and running really quickly. And you're able to do it all still within just this infrastructure, uh, which keeps it serverless. And again, it's all maintained on this platform. And you can just update and focus on, like Carrie said, just on your application needs and the infrastructure uh, takes care of itself and you can modify it as needed for uh, your needs and your visions of whatever your application is intended to do. So that is our demonstration of our album manager for using the Google Cloud Platform, but I hope it can show you some possibilities to demonstrate how you can utilize this platform for a serverless web application that you can use. Oh. I see Ari has his hand raised. Okay, never mind. Uh, and you can just use this uh, platform uh, for your needs uh, and be able to uh, use it to its full extent so that you can focus your time into your application features and development. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce the last slide uh, to close us off. And of course, uh, hand it off afterwards uh, to Carrie and Ari if they have any last thoughts. But let me just share that. Okay. Um, okay, and so I think you guys should be able to see the last slide. Yeah, we can have. see it. 
Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, it's so embrace the serverless uh, revolution. I know a lot of information today, but I hope you guys can see the significant advantages and in cost, scalability, and developer productivity. I can say for myself, I'm more used to handling, uh, like definitely I'm a Java developer and just seeing this uh, new tech or newer technology and such, I can see how it's gonna be so much easier in the future for serverless uh, web applications. Uh, it's ideal for a wide range of applications. So again, today was a very simple application to show, but Google Cloud Platform can definitely handle very, very complicated. Uh, applications as well. Uh, it, it will definitely help reduce operational overhead. Uh, and it allows you, again, to just focus on what your applications want to do. And that whole infrastructure bit, you can like Google handle a lot of that headache for you. And you just customize as you need for whatever web application you're looking for. Uh, so that's our last slide. Uh, and Carrie, are any last yep. thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, just keep in mind, like what you what you just saw, where she was able to develop a, a static front end, right? Static files for a front end, uh, uh, APIs to, to do some business logic and a, a data store, right? And that's the, as basic as you can get, but even as basic as you can get, if you were to do that without serverless uh, architecture, what would you need? You need, mm -hmm. if especially if you want it scalable, you'd likely have a server that serves um, the static files, that's some Linux server you got to set up, HTTP, uh, an Apache HTTP server, or uh, Nginx, right, serving out that. But potentially you could stick it all on the same node server where you would have your APIs. But we're talking about if you want it more scalable, uh, horizontally scalable. So you'd have, also then you'd have your node server running uh, Express, right, running for your, your REST calls. That's a whole nother server you'd have to manage. And then after that, you'd want to have your MongoDB, right, uh, a, a NoSQL database, likely MongoDB server running on another server, right? So all of that architecture, all of that is cut away from you. None of the management of security patches, making sure all of that is working, um, it, it's, it's just all already handled for you and you really can just focus on um creating the application it does it does cut a lot down um other than that i didn't have anything else we were open for questions are unless are you have any uh last comments i would just say nice demo kaylin and yeah thanks <laughs> thanks for all the the um helpful anecdotes and and stuff from your experience carrie really appreciate it of course yeah um, so we are open for questions if anyone has any. Can you remove the, uh, um, I'll change the presentation view. If you could take off, stop sharing your slides, please. There you go. Okay, let me un unspotlight you guys. All right, here we go. Um, I do have a question. Some My curiosity is, is would it be possible then to expand what you built to actually have the music and then be able to play the music? I know that's probably more than you could do in this demonstration, but is that something that would be, you know, additional code, you know, whatever Java or whatever you would prefer? Is that something you could be able to do in this situation? For sure. Um, but that would be less about serverless architecture, but yes, okay. it could be. You would probably have some sort of um uh client side uh player like a, a video player or, or you know multimedia player which would be more client side and that would be part of the uh uh when you saw the google cloud storage where it was running the actual html um uh code uh it would be a, around there you'd probably have some library that would then point to the file the mp3 file let's say it was inside of your Google Cloud storage, right? Just like you're referencing the images URL, you would reference some sort of media URL and you'd have a player uh, in your in your front end. And so, yes, it could be easily done. It could be easily done. So um, the other question I have is relative to the hackathon. So could somebody build a solution to one of the challenges using this type of methodology or because those tend to come with either displaying data or collecting data, 
it's not this kind of, of, of architecture can be used. So any sort of web type uh, uh, application you can do it, collecting data, displaying data, um, workflows, however you want, it's all, all capable using, <laughs> using this. Yeah. All right, and I got the ball rolling, too. everybody. <laughs> I got <laughs> and the it's ball cheap, rolling. Right? <laughs> yeah, and please you, ask questions uh, if you have any. Please turn on your screen. And I, if you're still here with us, please turn on your screen regardless so that we can see your smiling faces and ask away if you have any questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> This is gonna be one of my classes next year. <laughs> one of my classes next year is how to ask questions in workshops like this. <laughs> so I the think Tiger, a, Tiger did say uh, yeah. mahalo nui, which means thank you very much. Uh, a quick question, how, how the version control works? Like application version control would, I think that's a little, little, little different where we're, that would be more of how you're deploying your application and maintaining versions of your application. I think that's what you mean. Um, or are you talking about versions of the infrastructure? Since it's serverless, you don't have to worry about versions of the infrastructure. Tiger, which do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> just turn, if you don't want to turn your camera on, just turn your microphone on and, and answer the, if you can. Oh, wait. Source, Source code. code. Okay. So uh, here we go. There we go. Hi, hey, Tiger. Tiger. Yeah, I, I think it would be the same way you would you would normally do it. Like in generally, you would have your pipelines that would deploy your application. You would have your source code within your repos Git repository. Um, you have a particular version you want to do it. You would cut that cut that off. You probably put it in a branch, and then you would tag it, and then you you would do your pipeline to build it, and then it, your pipeline would automatically just deploy it to your infrastructure. So it would follow the same type of um, method for most applications where you would just build, you could tag it off, um, and then you would just uh, uh, deploy it to your infrastructure. He's saying. <laughs> OK, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other any other questions? Well, I want to say thank you to all three of you for the presentation today and allowing me to record it so that anyone can come back and revisit it. Uh, it was a nice little infrastructure. I like the demo and presentation mode. I'm going to probably use that as an example when we're telling our tech people how to do a presentation and demo. <laughs> that was very nicely done. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for your time. And uh, I, I look forward, uh, I'll make sure people ask you questions uh, <laughs> in the channel uh, when they want to know how to use tools like this. Uh, if you also have any other, uh, besides serverless applications, if you have any other uh, areas that you feel like you could answer and have support on, I know you guys do a lot of, of, of um, low no codes uh, implementation. So uh, it's always nice to have opportunities to ask the professionals how to do things, so. Absolutely. Sure, um, yeah. My background is honestly less in, less in uh, serverless and more in data science and Python. So if anyone has questions like that, I'm always happy to talk Python. Yeah, so it, it, I would appreciate uh, since you are in the Slack workspace, making a note on your workspace, the types of things that you would like to ask, you know, have people ask questions on. And I'll make sure that I, when I, when I talk about your, your uh, Slack channel on the kickoff next Saturday, that's next Saturday, everybody. Okay. Um, we'll, uh, I'll let them know that you guys are a resource for all the things you list in the, in the, your channel, so. And if you can't update your own description, let me know what description you want. I can add that for you, so. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Thelma. Thank you, uh, And thanks, everybody. We will have a booth at the very last day. <laughs> so I hope to see you at the booth. Uh, we'll answer questions there, too. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And thank you all for attending and uh, listening to this interesting presentation, so. Thanks, Thelma. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.